Awesome. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. We're really excited. Uh, we're remoting in from Ann Arbor, Michigan. We are two high-tech anthropologists at Menlo Innovations. You will hear more about that later. And today we're going to talk about uh, how we in, uh, create big change in organizations through small experiments. We're also really excited to follow that last presentation because although we won't use the word murmuration, you will certainly see that what we're talking about resonates with that theme. Definitely. Okay, so a little bit about Menlo Innovations. Yeah. We are a custom software design and development firm with a mission to end human suffering as it relates to technology. Our secret weapon in realizing this commitment is our high-tech anthropology practice, which combines user experience research, functional design, and business analysis to ensure that the software we build meets the needs of the people who use it. So in addition to building software, we also host 3,000 visitors per year to benchmark our company as a model for positive culture, collaborative engagement, and visual work management. As a result of this, uh, these, visit these visits, many companies are showing a lot of interest in adopting and adapting versions of our Agile-inspired culture and processes to increase their competitiveness in the dynamic global economy that we're all experiencing. So in response, our high-tech anthropology team has begun facilitating large-scale process and culture change mm -hmm. in non-software settings. And today we're gonna to tell you an early success story from this work. Mm -hmm. But first, we wanna talk about some signs of agility at Menlo and why people are so interested in how we work. Um, the first one is that we work in one week iterations, which shouldn't be surprising, uh, but these conclude with a weekly planning game meeting where clients prioritize estimated work tasks for the upcoming week within specified time and budget constraints. We also use work authorization boards to visually manage assigned project work in a central location that's accessible to the entire team so that everyone has a shared understanding of work scope and priorities. These work authorization boards not only visualize, uh, communicate uh, information outwards, uh, but also uh, for the team that's working on it, are able to uh, create a sense of communal, uh, communal communication um, to surface problems and work together to solve them. So finally at Menlo, all work is executed in pairs and this is to maximize quality and workforce flexibility. Through pairing, skills and project knowledge are strategically distributed across the team, enabling resources to be easily rotated across projects as needed. Well, all of these processes are now standard uh, parts of Menlo. They began as experiments designed to solve specific problems, such as how to plan and prioritize work, how to collaboratively problem solve, and how to increase accountability. Experimentation continues to be one of the primary means by which we exemplify agility in the way we work. It also is a key component of the way we execute our cultural and process transformation consulting process. So the story we want to share with you today is actually about a global tier one automotive supplier that we've been working with um, who's struggling to compete in the context of an industry-wide paradigm shift known as CASE. Um, and that stands for Connectivity, Autonomous Technology, Ride Sharing, and Electrification. The pressures that our client and other automotive suppliers currently facing uh, in this context to do more with less and faster are nearly universal at this point and require a radical reformulation of the way that work is being managed and executed. Yep. And to meet this market demand, our clients sought greater speed and flexibility in, they, in the way they work to better meet customer demands. Um, the pain that they experience should sound really familiar to everybody. Too much work and just not enough time. Limited resources with the experience to do the work due to siloed work functions and hero-based work assignments and unclear and conflicting priorities within and across teams at multiple levels of the organization. So all of these factors conspired to create a perfect storm in which urgent unplanned engineering work in support of automotive production consistently took precedence over important planned work leading to constant firefighting. The unplanned work included unexpected downtime, machine failures, and preparing for unexpected visits from customers and executives. So because they lived in a world where work that is on fire is the only work that gets done, 
they became accustomed to setting fires in order for work to get attention. They essentially became arsonists. Um, and this resulted in numerous challenges with workload management and the alignment of priorities across multiple levels of their workforce. The cycle of constant firefighting was extremely overwhelming to the engineers we work with and led to unsustainable overtime, high stress, and low morale. Mm -hmm. In other words, their world was perfectly designed to create the behavior that they were experiencing. And this was an unfortunate um, but unintentional consequence of the system in which they were living. So our clients need for agility when they came to us was expressed as a simple request. Help us be more efficient, where efficiency equals the output generated divided by the time, money and labor involved to produce that output. So if you want to increase efficiency, there's a couple ways to think about this. Mm -hmm. You can create the same output with fewer resources mm -hmm. or you create more output with the same resources. Yeah. Either way, uh, either way you choose to increase efficiency, success depends on utilizing the existing resources more effectively. So in order to help our client achieve this goal, we used our high-tech anthropology process to do a couple of things, starting with understanding their present state, uh, including the pain around work management. Envision where emergencies are anticipated and planned for uh, alongside proactive strategic work and then define the skills and process necessary to be successful. Finally, uh, designing the path to get there by introducing small experiments to incrementally build the processes uh, for in increased agility. So we, just, we, just, we started mm -hmm. our discovery effort with a deep dive into the daily engineering work of 24 indirect employees mm -hmm. supporting production. So these are engineers predominantly working in office cubes, but going out to the line as needed. Mm -hmm. They represented four teams distributed across four different plants. Each plant had a different function, mm -hmm. um, although they were all co-located co on a single campus. Um, and they represented three different roles, so mm -hmm. engineers, engineering supervisors, and then their management. Mm -hmm. And we quickly learned from our observations and interviews that everybody is suffering from the same self-limiting beliefs that impacted the way they work. So the first belief was that engineering work was so unique that it was impossible to standardize. Mm -hmm. The second was that the work was so specialized that it required six to 12 months for a new team member to be brought up to speed just to add value. And then the engineering work was so complex that it could only be managed by an equally complex work management system. They also assumed that the time it would take to plan the engineering work would only eat further into the available uh, time that they had to actually do real work. So what you're looking at here is basically a diagram of what we documented as their current capabilities. Mm -hmm. um, the self-limiting beliefs manifested themselves in the ways that engineers both defined and managed their work. Mm -hmm. um, because engineering work was assumed to be highly unique, team members defined and completed their tasks individually with almost um, no communication with others based on a just do it mentality. And this had several consequences. Um, one was that common reoccurring elements of the work within and across teams was often overlooked. Work was also unevenly distributed, leading certain individuals to be underutilized on the team while others were overutilized. So similarly, because engineering work was considered too complex and unpredictable to be managed, engineers tended to conduct their work in an ad hoc fashion based on a just figure it out mentality. Uh, as needs emerged, they would focus uh, to find ways to just squeeze it in. Um, and as a result, unplanned work took up the majority of engineering time leaving teams in a constantly reactive state. So while uh, leaving planned work untouched on the side and sometimes uncompleted. So this whole model of working, the just do it, just figure it out way, um, had negative consequences for the flexibility of their workforce. Mm -hmm. Specifically, it severely constrained their ability to quickly onboard new team members um, because of the fact that it took this 12, uh, six to 12 month period for them to learn enough to be productive in this environment. So from their perspective, it was considered uh, less efficient to give a high priority task to an available resource who wasn't yet an expert than to wait uh, for an expert resource to become available to complete that task, uh, which meant that most of the critical work wasn't uh, actually getting done. So this left us with um, 
the challenge of how do you move a team accustomed to working in a just do it, just figure it out way incrementally closer to a more flexible way of no. Characterize, stand for it, do it together. Luckily, right now I'm okay. I might go into. So uh, the key was to help them learn how to prioritize organizational effectiveness over individual efficiency by incrementally standardizing work and work management processes that would maximize workforce flexibility and their business agility. Um, and this required the development of individual capabilities. So we had to build skills on their teams um, in visual management, in communication, and in relationship building that would support a culture of transparency and collaboration. So change is possible, that's the good news, uh, but there is no silver bullet for how to do this. Um, there are also no shortcuts. Um, yeah. So the skills necessary to increase organizational effectiveness are built slowly step by step. That's, that's the main takeaway here. Mm -hmm. And we've learned through experience with this and other teams that growing a team's agility mm -hmm. requires that you meet them where they are. Mm -hmm. Oops, sorry. Sorry about that. So you have to meet them where they are. Mm -hmm. um, Learning uh, sophisticated skills really requires building those foundational skills through consistent daily practice. Um, so what we're going to talk about next are the experiments that we implemented following our discovery. Um, so we introduced a total of 12 different experiments across the four teams and the four different plans. Mm -hmm. But today we want to focus on just two that were um, foundational and really critical to the success that we continue to see with this organization. And those two are the top three board and daily stand up. So uh, each team member would dedicate the first 15 minutes of each day to write their top three important, but not necessarily urgent tasks uh, on a card. They would then post their top three priorities on a centrally located board visible to all their teammates and to management. So in addition, uh, team members would gather at the board and briefly share out their daily priorities in a daily stand-up meeting. And the purpose of these experiments was twofold. One, we were trying to build the basic skills mm -hmm. of defining and prioritizing individual tasks, mm -hmm. which while simple was something that they were completely um, unaccustomed to. And second, to make those priorities transparent to increase communication around alignment, risks, and opportunities for collaboration on the broader team. And the inspiration for this came from our discovery phase. Uh, we observed uh, team members struggled with setting priorities and completing work on a daily basis. And one of the things that we consistently heard was if you could just get, if I could just get one thing on my to-do list done each day, that that would be a huge win. So with that goal in mind, mm -hmm. and based on uh, the well-known concept from John Gall, mm -hmm. a complex system designed from scratch never works and cannot be patched up to make work, you must start over with a working simple system. Mm -hmm. So um, these were the initial steps that we took mm -hmm. um, to get this organization on the right path. But we didn't just design and deliver some simple experiments. We used a co-creation model. So uh, Menlo High Tech anthropologists like Molly and myself worked with the teams um, that they had studied, that we had studied, to introduce experiments and tie them to key problems that team members were experiencing. We held weekly check-in calls with key team members running experiments to answer questions and help them troubleshoot in the moment. And we provided targeted coaching remotely and on-site to equip local change agents with the skills necessary to support experiments on the ground. Around. Ultimately, this external accountability and support were key to the initial adoption and long-term impact of the experiment activities. Mm -hmm. And we want to share a couple stories with you about how the small experiments um, were the starting place for some big changes that are um, continuing to evolve. Mm -hmm. So first, through the participation in stand-up and the top three experiment, teams were able to start building the habit of defining, prioritizing, and communicating with each other about their work, allowing for greater collaboration and standardization. So we did um, numerous observations, not only of their current state, but also their interaction with these experiments. Um, and we saw across multiple teams the same uh, pattern emerging. Mm -hmm. So when they um, talked in the stand-up group and shared information about their work tasks, um, they began to identify patterns. So they saw where impor important but not urgent work like mentoring mm -hmm. uh, was falling through the cracks. They saw where individuals were working on related and overlapping tasks. Um, and 
could therefore troubleshoot in the moment to start streamlining their efforts mm -hmm. um, and support one another. Mm -hmm. And where help for team members was needed and available, um, they were able to leverage the collective skill set of the team to ensure that the high priority work was the work that was getting the attention it deserved. Second, by recognizing and codifying standard work using a single process, team members were ultimately able to proactively plan reoccurring tasks, mm -hmm. including unplanned work. Mm -hmm. um, so when we started with these teams, they were spending upwards of 50% of their time on unplanned work, um, but they weren't accounting for that, which meant that um, at least 50% of the planned work wasn't getting done. Uh, so in one of the plans, engineers were typically assigned to sec separate work based on their relative areas of expertise um, with, the, with an AC engine, so a rotor and a starter. Um, they were paired uh, to execute both sets of work. Uh, that was the experiment that was run. Um, and this allowed them to get the work done faster while learning how to do each other's work. So this was a, um, an example of the way that some of these exper experiments also enhance the flexibility of their workforce mm -hmm. um, by allowing them to pair individuals with different areas of expertise to expand skills. Mm -hmm. There was also an example in which um, different teams were able to swap members, um, again, to, to focus on getting high priority work done. So one understaffed team from mm -hmm. one plant was able to effectively incorporate an underutilized team from another plant um, via the shared practice of top three and daily standup. Mm -hmm. So even though the work itself was quite different, the fact that the process was familiar across the teams mm -hmm. um, made it much easier for the newly added resource to understand what was being worked on um, and how they could add value. And this was able to decrease the onboarding time for new team members um, as, as they were running these experiments. So one of the third stories, the habit of visualizing individual work tasks uh, and the status to be a broader set to a broader set of people provided the basis for leveling the workload of individual team members and assessing competing priorities. So there was, um, again, this is one example of many that we observed where a manager um, who regularly did this, approached mm -hmm. a team with the intention of signing uh, an unplanned urgent task, was now in the context of this visual board able to weigh individual team members' work, current workloads and the importance of their current tasks against the time commitment mm -hmm. and, and importance of the new task that they were um, seeking to introduce. And so that information um, weighed into the decision that they ultimately made to take that new task elsewhere. So as teams understanding and comfort level with the existing experiments increased, they were able to make small adjustments to improve their, improve their effectiveness and address new problems, such as uh, adding red cards to their visualization board to represent um, unplanned work so that they could see how much time that was, um, that was adding to their day, uh, or adding a colored dot to a task to represent the status uh, when it was stopped so that they could measure the number of interruptions. They affectionately dubbed this the caterpillar because these dots would add up and slowly over time you just ended up with this sort of thick stack, um, which was really helpful for them in understanding where their time was going. And finally, they began assigning avatars to different team members and sharing fun facts during the stand-up meeting, um, which lightened the mood and helped build trust across the team. Mm -hmm. Um, so these were not uh, experiments that were ever intended to be static. Um, they evolved over time, and the teams implementing them were um, played a critical role in doing that. The permission to adjust the experiments in these ways increased individual ownership, engagement, and ultimately their effectiveness. As the skills of the team members increased based on their experience with the experiments, they, will, they were able to get more done and reported a greater sense of accomplishment overall. This in turn rapidly increased each team's level of engagement and willingness to collaborate, uh, creating several centers of positive deviance within the organization that served as models for what could be achieved throughout um, through the use of these tools. So one of the most remarkable examples of this shift was um, an engineering supervisor who was initially the most reluctant participant in this change effort. Um, and he, be, he ultimately became one of the most vocal advocates for the adoption of Menlo experiments. Um, it was uh, just a sea change to watch um, the very sort of downtrodden, quiet, um, stressed out team uh, all of a sudden come to life um, through the use of these different experiments. And so through him uh, and others encouragement and concert with strategic support from leadership, um, the ultimate impact of these initial teams we worked with 
um, scaled organically from 24 individuals um, to over 150, and that number is still growing. Um, they also expanded from those initial four plants that we started with mm -hmm. um, to a total of six different sites mm -hmm. uh, with on that, within that same campus. Uh, but their work isn't done. They're still growing and iterating on those experiments. The overall impact of the experiments was a shift away from an inherently fragile uh, and inflexible state based on and reliant on individual expertise towards a more stable set of processes that are building a greater organizational effectiveness through the coordination of those individual efforts, um, but focused on the team and the overall team effectiveness. So with that, we'd like to leave you with a few parting thoughts about what works when using small experiments mm -hmm. to advance organizational agility. Mm -hmm. um, most importantly, start small. And then be clear about what problems you're trying to solve. It's also important to think about um, focusing on tools mm -hmm. to build relationships rather than the tools themselves. Mm -hmm. And think about standardizing work and processes. Um, that systems thinking uh, is an incredibly important uh, cornerstone of the way that we approach this. Um, but thinking about being able to standardize both of those things. And yet at the same time, continuing mm -hmm. to empower teams to tweak things that aren't working by introducing new twists on old experiments. Mm -hmm. So each step along the path is a win, right? In that journey towards big change in an organization. Um, start small, take small steps, and you'll be on your way there, right? Awesome.